Welcome back to the Republican Roundtable. I'm Tim Erlander, the host, and my co-host, Mark Sullivan, is right over here. And Mark, it's good to see you again, and I hope you had a good Christmas. Good to be back with you, Tim, and yes, I did. And we have a special guest here, uh, Twyla Brace. Twyla is the president and founder of Citizens Council for Health Freedom. How's that's that? It. Did I that's get it right? great. Okay. Yes, yes. And uh, got it right on this card with a picture of a beautiful baby on it. And that should get us going. Good. Uh, Twyla, let's just get started. Uh, let's get some of your background so people got, who are watching this have some idea who sure. you are. Sure. Sure. Um, I am a registered nurse by training mm -hmm. and started this organization with another person, Martin Kellogg, about 22 years ago. Citizens Council for Health Freedom and have been working ever since to try and protect freedom for patients and doctors in this country to protect all the different uh, ways or to look at all the different ways that uh, are needed to happen in order to make that freedom um, happen for patients and doctors. So You must have just croaked when they came up with Obamacare, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, our organization really started because of Hillary Care. Mm -hmm. So uh, Hillary Care, really the, the realization that uh, she and her husband were going to put us all into managed care organizations. Yeah. And though even, even though the bill went away and was considered a failure, it really didn't go away. And that was the realization that it really wasn't going away. There are several bills that mm -hmm. Congress passed afterwards that were pieces of Hillary Care. And then now we have Obamacare, which is just sort of like the, uh, a, a you know. Mod modified Hillary That's Care exactly is what right. it really is. That's so right, yeah. There's just a few, a few less penalties in there and, and a few more moving parts. Yeah. Well, right now we're in a very critical time in our country's history, as I'm sure you are definitely mm -hmm. are aware, and we're looking to the to repeal Obamacare. Thank God. Uh, I run into people who tell me they have fourteen hundred dollars for family insurance per month, That's and I look at them and I says, "Huh." Hmm? Yeah. Well, well, Obamacare That's was you. originally yeah. they said you could keep your own doctor. Uh, it's going to cost you less. Everyone's going to mm -hmm. get coverage, and uh, e everything they told us. I know Obama has said that with a smile. Yes, I remember fact, that. Uh, you know, the cost of insurance has gone up. Most people have been able to keep their doctor, and it just goes downhill from there. Uh, One of the other promises that um, the president gave was that the during his very first term, so he did this when he was a candidate, right? right. During his first term, people's premiums would come down, family premiums would come down by $2,500. <laughs> but they have done he was right, but they, He's right, but the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and they've gone up by more yeah, than $2,500. Considerably. Mm -hmm. considerably. Mm -hmm. That, and, and, and a lot of people's coverage has come down, too. They haven't been able to afford the coverage they used to have. That's right. That's they right. thought that they were going to get bailed out because everybody would buy the health insurance. And what happened was, of course, that people who didn't think they needed it didn't buy it. Yeah. In a lot of cases, they decided it was cheaper to pay the penalty than buy the insurance. That's right. They did. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the thing is that the, um, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, said, Chief Justice Roberts said, that it was unconstitutional to force people to purchase health insurance. But then he sort of twisted himself into a pretzel and said that they could be penalized by for not doing it. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, he said the penalty could never be high enough for it to coerce people into purchasing. And so I, I believe if I remember the numbers correctly, there is something like um, nearly six million people that have paid the penalty and um, over 20 million mm -hmm. people that have found an exception. And the law has nine exemptions mm -hmm. and 14 hardship waivers. And the 14th hardship waiver, anybody really could probably get yeah. because it says, if for any other reason you find health insurance unaffordable, that's, you mm -hmm. can, you can uh, yeah. ask for a hardship waiver. But people don't actually know well, that I, that I think the, I think the first group to get an exemption from Obamacare was Congress. And Congress did mm -hmm. get an exemption. The, the people who passed it decided they didn't want it. That's correct. That's been typical the rest from of us had Congress for a very long time. They exempt themselves from the laws they make the rest of us live by. Right. That's not an unusual move. 
So, so people are well aware of the fact that the prices are higher, yeah. mm -hmm. the access to care is lower, uh, there are narrow networks, and then this latest round of what is being offered for this year in 2017, there's a lot of people who have found out that they no longer have a network, out, they, they have no out-of-network coverage. So let's just say they go and take a vacation in Florida. You know, if they get sick, A lot of the health insurance providers mm -hmm. have gotten out of the market. Mm -hmm. That too. At least in Minnesota. That's correct. So, so the selection of, of, uh, of, of providers is way down, and half of those that are in the market have been almost bribed to stay. You know, saying, you know, saying the, you know, the, the state will... will, will uh, Let me just ask a quick know. question. What happens if I go to Canada and I get sick? Is there a big disaster there? No, Canada will take care of you. They will. They That's will. what I was you're, hoping you'd say. You're planning on going to Canada <laughs> yes. real soon here, Tim? <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, I am. But, <laughs> but you may not like the care, or you, of course, may pay cash for well, care. Well, they don't like it either. I, I, my wife is, was a Canadian. Oh, I see. She okay. became an American citizen, but we always went up to visit yeah, her. That's why family. they come down here to get treatment that they That's can't right. get up there. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's why doctors come down here from mm -hmm. Canada, because they can't make any money up yeah. in their native country, which is interesting. Yeah. Right. Well, if they are going to repeal ACA it sounds like I mean there's uh, you know they're getting ready at this at this at this stage when we're filming this mm -hmm. they are getting ready uh, making the initial passing initial laws in order mm -hmm. to repeal the ACA right. of course we're seeing in the paper 18 million people will lose insurance if they repeal it and, and all, all the scare headlines what is happening exactly? Okay, so there's several things happening. So both the House and the Senate have passed a resolution to, that leads to and tells them to put the repeal language in the bud budget mm -hmm. reconciliation bill. So now it's a process of actually writing up the budget reconciliation bill. They, must, they already have a prototype for it because they sent one of those to President Obama last, or in December of 2015. He vetoed it in January of 2016. It was a rather limited repeal. So it, it, the reconciliation bill can't just, you know, repeal all 2,700 yeah. pages of it. It can only repeal certain pieces that have to do with the budget. So they can defund a lot of Obamacare, a lot of the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. through that budget reconciliation bill. The mat it, what they're trying to decide now is exactly what to put in there, what they think the parliamentarian will let them get by with, and perhaps whether or not they can also rescind all the regulations of Obamacare. So for your listeners and your viewers, there's 2,700 pages of the law. Right. There's more than 40,000 pages of the regulations and the memos and the guidances and everything that has the, the, come the, out. This, this is the one that you got to read it in order to or pass it in order to find out what's in it because they didn't give them time to read it. Yes, but most people will never read it, and so mm, most people right. will never know what's mm. in it. Only the bureaucrats who wrote it really well, know what's in it. Congress didn't know what was in there. Half of them were surprised at some of the stuff that was in there afterwards. I'd Those are the ones that were for it. I'd be surprised if anybody has read the 40,000 pages yeah. except the, the bureaucrats. The bureaucrats. Well, hello. Yeah. What is your opinion of the Congress that's right now preparing to do something about Obamacare? Are you confident they're going to get the job done? Um, having visited there in uh, December of 2016, so not all that long ago, mm -hmm. what I really saw was different factions. So I saw the faction that really wants to repeal the whole thing, kit and caboodle, right? Um, and uh, might even like to take it in front of the Senate and the House for a full repeal vote, even though in the Senate they wouldn't probably get it through. They'd have to have the Democrats would filibuster it. That would all be very interesting, isn't, but they're not going to go that direction. Isn't some of the language that they've used now to, uh, to, to avoid a filibuster? Um, so, so going into a budget passing. reconciliation, they can avoid the filibuster, yeah. but they can't repeal the entire law. Mm -hmm. okay. So another, the... another faction is to say that we want to get rid of all the words, but we want to keep the $3 trillion and, and use it the way we, the Republicans, want to use it. And then there's a faction that says we want to do budget reconciliation and then we want to replace it. Now, one of the problems from our organization's perspective is what are they going to replace it with? The problem that we have in healthcare today is because the federal government got into healthcare. 
So to replace one federal program thinking. with another federal program is not a good idea. However, if what they do is devolve everything back to the states, and for, for instance, if they would send a Medicaid back as block grants, or if they would send money to create high-risk pools for people with pre-existing conditions, and if they would say that um, the regular catastrophic coverage is no longer prohibited, uh, Obamacare actually uh, destroyed the private insurance market for catastrophic coverage because it says that anyone age 30 and older can't have it. So it's all managed care all the time unless you're age 29 or younger. So there are some serious things that they could do, sending it all back to the states that would not leave the federal government in control. Do you think that's a good idea? Yep. Okay, so this is I do. this is the program that you would be willing to support. <laughs> yes, I think it's a very good idea to send it back to the states. The federal government has no purview over health care. They took that. They, mm -hmm. they took it okay. starting with the uh, wage and price controls in the 1940s, which caused us to have employer-sponsored coverage. Mm -hmm. And employer-sponsored coverage, as much as people like it, it's really a handcuff. It's really the employer's handcuff on the people. And then as soon as you get sick, and then if you can't stay with your job, you not only lose your job, you lose your health insurance. And now you end up with a pre-existing condition. People should own their own policies, and we would love for parents to buy their children policies before they're born and hand it off to them when they're 18 and have lifelong policies, not even have to go into Medicare. You know, so everything that, that brings health care policy back to the states and back mm -hmm. to the individuals is the best and the least expensive way to, to go. Okay, so you're so you're comfortable with what they're doing right now. This is the well, bottom line, as far as I can tell. I'm comfortable with the fact that they're talking about they want to repeal, but I think mm -hmm. we're going to find out what repeal means yeah, to them. Yeah, exactly. Okay. What are they and talking I don't about? know all over what the place, it means so. yet to them. Okay, <laughs> so you got a, so you got your fingers crossed a little bit as well. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, so we're waiting to see. Right now, you right right now you got some that want to go. Black shock and barrel, some that want to just kind of feel their way or kind of go halfway, mm -hmm. just, they're just all over the... Now, now I've noticed there's been a lot of headlines saying, okay, if, if, it's, if, if, if they, they uh, make ACA go away, all these people are going to immediately wind up without health insurance. Now, to some degree, that's wrong. Am I correct? Yeah, you are I mean, correct. Because, because, I mean, it would be like next year before it would be the earliest that this law could even take effect. And anything that they had this year would still remain in effect, am I, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, that would still so, remain in effect because they'd make sure it still remained in right, effect. Well, that, that's already in a budget that's been passed, the, you know, the, the whole, whole ball of wax for uh, 2017. I, I think the thing to understand, and so I wrote an article that got in the Daily Caller, and the mm -hmm. Daily Caller gave it a title something like, you know, don't, don't worry about the 20 million uh, uninsured right. statistic, uh, or don't let it scare you. And they really shouldn't let it scare them because if you actually sort out who those 20 million people are, what you find out is there's about 14, uh, was it 13 or 14 million people on Medicaid, but 60% of them were eligible before Obamacare right. ever happened, right? And so then if you went to block grants, the states would be able to take those folks that they have in their state and cover them all. They could actually even bypass the managed care organizations and do direct payments mm -hmm. to hospitals in block grants to the hospitals yeah. that take care of the Medicaid patients. Now there's one thing that always puzzled me about o Obamacare, and that is that you, I always understood that if you w went to an emergency room in, in a hospital that they had to take you. Yes, that's a different federal law called EMTALA. Right. And was that working? Oh, uh, it yeah. it does work. Mm -hmm. It is not a really um, inexpensive way to do it. However, Obamacare did nothing to change that. The the uh, percentage of people using the emergency room did not go down, and in fact, because more people were covered, it seems right. like it, it was either people, the same or a little bit more people were using it. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's an interesting development. And yes. I think it, it, did they do anything? It, did anything happen under Obamacare that they predicted? Or did it all go the other way? Well, they predicted that a lot of people with pre-existing conditions that wouldn't get coverage otherwise or hadn't chosen to get coverage otherwise 
would end up in the exchanges, and that's true, but they predicted a lot more people would end up in the exchanges because they thought that the mandate to, uh, to buy coverage would stay in effect. But when the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to mandate that you buy it, all sorts of people decided not to. Plus, of course, the Obama administration gave all these exemptions. So people, rather than paying those huge prices, mm -hmm. decided <coughs> to go get their exemptions. And, you know, one of the interesting things is how health sharing, which is the second exemption. So if you're part of a health sharing organization, and there are really uh, six Let major back up ones. A bit. What's, a, what's a health sharing organization? A health sharing organization is essentially a cooperative. So that everybody who is a member of a health sharing organization uh, decides to help people who are part of the membership pay their medical expenses. And every one of them works differently. For instance, Samaritan Ministries uh, tells their members every month who to send their check to. So the people who have needs actually get hundreds of checks from people all over the country to pay their medical bills. And then they negotiate on a cash-based price because it doesn't go through insurance. So they ask for a cash price, payment at the time of service price, and often it's much less expensive. Interesting. Yep. And they have skyrocketed. Their membership has virtually tripled what as a result of Obamacare. If, if, if Obamacare was repealed, would that still go on? Yep, because it has been going on. Actually, one of the requirements for that being an exemption, I think, was that the organization had to be in existence before 1990. So they have long been in existence, but they've been much smaller. Now, all sorts of people have learned this much more personal and much less expensive way to get their medical needs met. And mm -hmm. I do not think they're, they're going to shrink. I think that they will uh, I, stay I, I, I guess there probably are not near the restrictions on care that you can get, especially in... When you get older, yeah. there are a number number of restrictions in Obamacare on how much care and what kind of care you can get depending mm -hmm. on your physical condition as you age and, right. and start requiring more, phys uh, more care. Well, that's an interesting thing, too, because some of the health sharing organizations uh, have a cutoff at age 65, but some of them don't. If you principally or morally mm -hmm. are not agreeable to Medicare, you can stay in. But this is a piece that we are trying to get the Trump administration to work on. I don't know if you know that you cannot get out of Medicare unless you're willing to lose your Social Security benefits. Now, this is not a law. This is a rule that the Clintons put in back in 1993. Hmm. No, that it's, was, I was unaware of it. That's right. And so it's written in a booklet. Uh, there was a, a lawsuit that went to, all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court denied it. Uh, they just refused to hear the lawsuit in 2013. Uh, Dick Armey, who used to head up the U.S. House, was one of the plaintiffs in that lawsuit. Because you see, there are people who have, for instance, the federal employees plan or TRICARE or even their own personal insurance mm -hmm. who would prefer to keep that because Medicare is an inferior product, right? Well, but they well, lose well, their social actually, security. Actually, you keep both. I know TRICARE and the Med and Medicare, and Medicare becomes a primary provider. That's exactly the right. TRICARE becomes secondary. That's right. And, and in effect, most, most things are entirely paid for. Well, there, w there are lots of people with TRICARE who would prefer to have only TRICARE, not pay any of the costs of Medicare, and just have only TRICARE, mm -hmm. and get out of the, the problem with losing your Social Security benefits. They don't want Medicare to be their primary. Uh, so anyway, we believe that the Trump administration could simply sign an executive order because it's not even a law and be done with it. And so that would in, open an entire new market for lifelong insurance coverage for people of all ages. You think he'll do that? We will see. <laughs> I know, he, he, he has a lot of executive he orders. A, He's got a sign right off the top when he first right. goes in. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, we got four years, uh, right? <laughs> uh, o o Obama's been very busy with his own executive orders in the mm -hmm. last eight years. He has. That's for sure. His executive yeah. orders, and, his uh, regulations, and all sorts of things. Matter of fact, he, he's, 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 he's done mo go. most of his legislating right with using executive orders That's rather than going through it, normal, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, normal congressional. Yep. Uh, and a lot of them have gone to, got to the courts and they ended up being overturned. Turned. That's correct. It's, it's a amazing story. Yes. Uh, I think I don't think any president has ever abused his power like that, other than this one. Yes. Well, we have. Well, by the time your viewers see this, right, we will already have a new president. Thank God. And uh, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what we what they can all undo yes. from President we'll Obama. Yes. We'll see what they can do. 
Well, they made a lot of promises, and they better live up to them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll kill them. <laughs> well, what, 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 are, what are some of the programs that we might be looking at or that are possibilities if they, if, if they dump the ACA, Obamacare? What are, what are some, of the, some of the programs that we might, maybe we might be looking at? I know, I know there's one that you work with uh, the, a little bit, I believe, the, the, the wedge. Yes, the wedge. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? So from our perspective, we have to get back to freedom. So what Hillary Care did and actually what Medicare is doing, because Medicare now 30 or 33 mm percent -hmm. of the Medicare population is in managed care. People don't understand when they pick a Medicare Advantage product, they're, they're picking uh, more limited access at the, at the back end. Mm -hmm. So when you really get sick and when you really need all your choices, you might not get them. So with Medicare, with Obamacare, with Hillary Care, all of it was to drive us to managed care. Managed care corporations or health plans are really a socialized medicine structure in a corporate format. Right. So everything is driving its way towards socialized medicine, government run health care. And we want to drive health care in this country back well, to free yeah, markets I, I, and I, freedom. I, I know, originally, a lot of people used to say that Obamacare was just a way to literally destroy the health insurance industry mm -hmm. and, and eventually wind up with single payer. Right. Mm -hmm. And really, it's, it's doing that because it has shrunk everything down into managed care, and then the managed care organizations have purchased or gotten hold of greater and greater parts of the population so that it has consolidated. And when it has consolidated, that means prices are higher and choices are fewer. Mm -hmm. um, so our organization started something called the Wedge of Health Freedom. And the wedge is uh, three things. If I can use a... Uh, a little, go, uh, <laughs> go, 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 go for it. <laughs> this is our brochure called uh, uh, the Wedge of Health Freedom. We're calling it the Better Way. And uh, it is essentially three things. It is a way to show that there is a free trade zone today in the, in the circle of health care. There is a free trade zone, and we're, and we're just saying then this slice is where freedom happens, where patients and doctors today freely interact with each other, cash, check, or charge. They may have insurance, they may have Medicare, they may have Medicaid, but when they come to this kind of doctor, cash, check, or charge, and all the prices. Kind of the way it used to be done exactly back right. in the 30s or whatever. You go to your doctor, mm -hmm. you, and you, you literally deal directly with your doctor. You pay your doctor that's directly. Right. Mm -hmm. If you have insurance or whatever, you just say, okay, that's fine. I will submit this bill to the insurance, and the insurance can well, reimburse me. Well, back in the good old days, you know, it, it, if you know. I remember correctly, uh, doctors just understood that you know, some people couldn't pay, and so they didn't try to, they didn't try to make them pay. As a matter of fact, I talked to an 82-year-old surgeon down in, from Mississippi, mm -hmm. and he said part of his training was that 25% of his patients would pay nothing. 50% mm -hmm. would pay something, and 25% would pay the whole price. And that was the expectation. And why was that? Because medicine is a mission. Mm -hmm. And the fact yeah. of the matter is, as we have moved to managed care, we have moved it into a business. Mm -hmm. And we need to keep it charitable and charitability. My, my, my first of wife father was a doctor oh, okay. and she when she was growing up she could remember up in Superior okay she remember him coming home with with big fish and, and, and chunks of venison and all kinds of things that, that his patients would give him in lieu of, mm -hmm. of, of cash payments and sure well um, um, if I just show this to your viewers because this is with the wedge this is what we consider the future okay. so today we have this triangle this triangle right here uh, this is actually the wedge. We we want to identify this free trade zone here, mm -hmm. and then we want to uh, we call it the wedge so that people could grab onto something. Then we want to make it bigger, and eventually we want all of healthcare to be done this way. But this diagram down here is how we want to change healthcare with the wedge. Today, the payers at the top, and the patient and the doctor are down here. The only thing that really counts in healthcare is this relationship between the patient and the doctor. Mm -hmm. But everything goes round and round and round. You know, whether it's uh, care, nobody knows what kind of care they're going to get. Nobody knows if they're going to get paid, what's the price they're going to get paid. We want to just split it up, patient, doctor, patient, hospital, and patient insurer, and do exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Indemnity insurance pays the patient. Right. The patient right. pays well, the doctor the, 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 the hospital. Patient, and you, you also, the patient, you is also gone. bring, in a sense, capitalism into this. That's right. Uh, because right now, 
patients have no idea what's being charged. That's right. That's right. I don't have any charge. I have three and, heart attacks. And, and, and no the deals idea that the, the doctors cost. have yes. with the insurance right. companies and the, those that aren't mm -hmm. insured, you pay you know, three times as much. And, Right. Uh, you know, where you could almost go doctor shopping if you want. Right. Speaking of heart we, attacks, we're getting kind of close doctor to the end of our time here. Okay. I think we've been enjoying <laughs> well, this. Well, just so we're starting to have fun. <laughs> I know, I was just thinking that. Uh, you have any, is there any other topics that you want to make sure we cover before we get done? So I'll just say in Minnesota, we are, we are actively engaged in Minnesota here at the legislature. Mm -hmm. One, to undo Minsher, which is the Minnesota variation of Obamacare. Yeah. One, to stop Real ID, which is the national identification system that we believe will lead to Hillary's uh, no card, no care system. Um, and then the other thing is just uh, what we call baby DNA. So uh, the federal government has decided to get rid of the protection that we had in law, got in law in 2014, that said that children's DNA could not be used, uh, which happens and is taken for newborn screening and then stored by the states. Children's DNA cannot be used for research without parent consent. That was a law we got in 2014. Obama signed that law. And now a rule was issued at, which has completely obliterated that law. So you can, you can repeal a law with a rule? Because the law says that it goes away when the rule comes out. But they promised that they would have all those protections in the rule and they didn't. Well, that's typical. Yes. They made a lot of promises that I don't think they ever intended to keep. This yes. is what I think we're all suspiciously Yep. Thinking so all here. of these things well. we're still working on and we'll continue mm -hmm. to work on them uh, amongst other issues as well. Well, let's just hope that we manage to get through this mess and get things back to something that looks halfway normal. Well, as long as we have people engaged, we will get back to freedom. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Trial, how big is your organization? Well, I guess it depends on how you uh, want to count it, but we have got about five people in our office. We've got a board mm -hmm. and we have a Health Freedom Minute that is heard on almost 800 stations around the country. Um, do, you, do, you, do you have a list of, of you want to say followers or subscribers? We've or? Got, yep, we've got um, about 13,000 subscribers to our weekly e-news, which okay. people can get at cchfreedom.org. Okay. They can just sign up at the top of the homepage. And now we have the Wedge, and we've got probably 12, 1,300 people who are keeping updated about the wedge, and we have 200 doctors who are on our find a practice map, which okay. they can find at jointhewedge.com. Okay. Jointhewedge.com. And on that note, I think we are gonna have to call it quits. Uh, okay. We've had a wonderful time, and you certainly have given <laughs> us a lot of information. I, Thank you I so won't much. pretend I understood everything, but <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> I'm glad you're out there, Twyla. Thank you very much for what you do. Thank you very much. Very much and we'll see Thank you, you next time.